Low density parity check. It is low density parity check, but it's not a good example of low density parity check. No, it's not. No, no, no. It's not better. It's 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 like Tarek. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not much better than Tarek. Hey, can people in the uh, Zoom can hear me? Can the audience online hear clearly here? Okay. Okay. So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Harvard University of Quantum Math Mathematics Seminar Series. We are very delighted to invite Margarita Davidova from MIT. She'll be speaking about perfect photomorphisms and quantum computation. Uh, let me remind the audience, please feel free to speak out and ask questions. Yeah. yeah, thank you for introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here. Uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk about this new sort of trend in quantum error correction, but hopefully it will be interesting for a broader audience. So I will start by motivating it from quantum error correction perspective, but um, then in reality, like I, I really hope that people from other fields could. Uh, find something useful in this and be inspired to maybe do something in this domain. Okay, I would like to start by thanking my collaborators. These are brilliant people and I had as much fun as it's possible to have uh, doing research for them. Um, okay, so, so as I said, my motivation is gonna come from quantum error correcting side. So there is gonna be some quantum error correction language in the beginning, but in reality, this also connects nicely to topological phases. So it's, um, and probably to some interesting math that I probably want to be able to kind of give a scope of. Um, but yeah, but the motivation comes from quantum. Okay, so before starting, I would like to uh, just translate between several different languages of talking about things, specifically uh, between the language of topological quantum codes and the more condensed natural language. So in uh, topological quantum codes are usually uh, uh, stabilizer codes, meaning that we specify a stabilizer group that is a subgroup of Pauli group on uh, little n qubits. And um, so uh, that is put in correspondence with the Hamiltonian, where local terms uh, would be those uh, stabilizers or op operators in the stabilizer group. Okay. And uh, the code. Uh, is, is basically the same thing as a code space. It means that there will be like some finite number of states that are stabilized by all the operators in the stabilizer group, meaning that there are, are all plus one again values of, of these stabilizers. And that gives us uh, logical states within this degenerate code space. And on the other side, we have a ground state code space of this Hamiltonian. So the same uh, so this is a commuting projector Hamiltonian, therefore each state satisfying this condition on the left will also belong to the ground state of the Hamiltonian on the right. Okay, so the logical operators of the code are the operators that perform transformations of logical operator once you specify how exactly you encode the logical information. Uh, and uh, specifically, the uh, like we, we usually construct the basis of operators by looking at poly operators, and these would be the operators that commute with everything in the stabilizer group, but are not within the stabilizer group. And uh, the logical operators from perspective of connect matter are really the symmetries of the uh, code space. Okay. I was kind of commenting about the symmetry here. I yeah. think the symmetry somehow is the symmetry, the, the lab corresponding to the logical operator that's an extended operator, is that right? Yes, but but we also like, like we, in principle, global symmetries would also be a logical operator, but it would be just like a logical, what we usually would call a logical gate. Mm -hmm. But that is still a logical operator as well. So it's like a string like operator, so just a subclass of all logical operators to okay. think of. And um, uh, just, just to the comment that suppose you consider the logical operator that is extended, then those are actually the symmetry corresponding to the, the objects that's being extended as a higher symmetry. Yes, exactly. So, so those symmetry can be for those higher symmetry. Absolutely, yeah. The yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Okay, so then, um, so, okay, so why are we interested in topological codes specifically for quantum information is because they offer topological protection of quantum information in the sense that while it is easy to generate these codes by local operators, such as these checks in the Pauli uh, stabilizer group, 
um, the operators that toggle the quantum information between different states have a very large weight, which means that it's hard for nature to accidentally apply these operators to your state and thus corrupt the logical state. And that's what is topolo topological protection of information is. And uh, on the physics side, it connects nicely to topological order, which again cannot be revealed and also like cannot go between the different topological sectors by local operators. And that like, is the other side of the coin. Okay, so what are the, um, so uh, then another important uh, thing in quantum codes are the errors, because that's what we, like that's why the quantum codes uh, came about. So the errors are usually assumed to be caused by some very natural local operators, maybe some independent distribution of local operators that can occur in your system, um, or maybe by some thermal noise at low temperature. And uh, these would correspond to a small, like, like usually we would use some simple models where we decompose each possible error into poly operators, so to low weight poly operators. And uh, on the other hand, in these uh, topological models of the lattice, we would have excitations that would be uh, particles that are endpoints of strings in the higher dimension that would be loops corresponding to the boundaries in them. So, okay, yeah, sure. So, oh, these are just like, yeah, they are logical polys. These are members of this. Uh, Okay, so now, uh, so what is the promise of the uh, topological quantum error, in general quantum error correction, actually? So the promise is that uh, if we say that there is a code with the parameters, usually you would say n, k, d, it's a quantum code, and n would be the number of physical qubits, k would be the number of logical qubits, and d would be the code distance, then the distance is the significant number that, said, that tells that uh, any weight, uh, any error that has weight means support uh, less than distance can be detected and uh, errors that is less than half of that distance can be corrected. That's the promise of a um, quantum error correcting code. And one example of such code, which is extremely famous is the Tori code. And if you don't recognize the Tori code it's because this is sort of like very specific, uh, uh, a very specific way to, to, to show it. Uh, so if you put, uh, if you look at the dual lattice here, so here the, cube, the data qubits are on are these white circles, and if you put edges through these um, um, data qubits, you will see that there is a one qubit per edge, and you will recover the usual square lattice star code that has x and z operators. Uh, here, z operators will be the vertex terms, and the x operators will be the overhead terms. And um, this is a, like the paradigmatic example of a topological. Uh, topological order that can be also used in a lattice in order to generate a topological quantum error correcting code. And, uh, okay, so how do we actually uh, correct errors in such codes? So um, an error string would correspond, like say I have like a set of like errors on occurring on neighboring qubits and say these are X type errors and they will actually violate uh, the uh, Z stabilizer, specifically this one and this one. Uh, on the um, endpoints of the string. So this would be like a small error string. So any sort of error can be projected into poly basis and then decomposed into such strings. And um, the, if you, if you, the, the values of the stabilizers at these violated plaquettes will be flipped to minus one by, for example, X step uh, error chain. And um, the point is that we would need to measure all the stabilizers of the code and then look at the uh, stabilizers that got minus one value. And these stabilizers would be violated and th that would be called the error syndrome. And then from error syndrome, we can use some efficient algorithms in order to determine how to correct the error. And then there exist guarantees that we would, uh, with probability going to one and the dynamic limit, we can recover the logical state. So we, for example, do the uh, uh, syndrome matching and uh, that allows us to correct errors. But I think the, uh, point why I was saying this is because this tells us that performing measurements is unavoidable. In order to be able to actually work with the systems, we have to perform measurements. So that's first uh, first message. And the other one is that in reality, um, so for the threshold theorem to hold, uh, one has to perform measurements uh, repeatedly. So which is shown on the right. So in reality, if one wants to encode logical information in 
uh, using toric code, one would have to periodically repeat stabilizer measurements in time. The reason behind this is that if there is any non-zero probability of measurement outcome being incorrect, um, in order for the threshold theorem to hold, one needs to consider a uh, two plus one dimensional uh, like model. Uh, for this, you need to sort of like introduce 10 dimension and you have to perform the measurements repeatedly, basically to uh, cancel out the, the, uh, the, the situations which arise because of the possible measurement errors. And yeah, and another side of this is that uh, there is no topological organ of 2 plus 1D at finite temperature. And again, like if we want to even consider dealing with 2, two plus 1D topological order, inspired systems, we would have to perform these measurements to cool down the system. So measurements are unavoidable, that's sort of the message. So, um, so this uh, kind of br brings me to introducing the first bouquet code that has ever been um, proposed, which is the Hastings half honeycomb code. So um, I would say that the broad, broad idea is that since measurements are unavoidable, why perform rep repetition of the same measurements over and over? Can we do something more sophisticated than that? Can we do something smarter? Can we do something different at least? And the answer is yes. And the first example is this uh, first locate code, the honeycomb code. So what is it? It is a uh, protocol of uh, periodic protocol of measurements that anti-commute. And um, they're performed in uh, two-dimensional lattice. In fact, they are two qubit measurements. Uh, and already after four rounds of measurements in the entire lattice, so the toric code ground state will be prepared. And after that, it will, the state of the system will uh, keep evolving between different instances of the toric code. Uh, and these measurements basically will be pushing the quantum information forward. Uh, but what is important for the quantum information application is that during this process, we will also be able to infer the values of the stabilizer. And this is what we directly measure to the case of the toric code. And inferring the balance of the stability is what is needed for us to either correct the errors or to pull down the system. So uh, that is a given in this code. And um, yeah, and it has, this code also has very nice features, which is for measurement-based architectures, it outperforms the usual implementation of the Toric code, but also um, it is a protocol that has period three, but actually every period three, it implements an EM automorphism of the Toric code meaning that there is this effective period doubling of the actual evolution. And that is an interesting feature that I have been studying a lot. So what is the general for K code? Uh, it is basically just a generalization of what I just showed. It doesn't have to be a Toric code anymore. It can be any, like probably not even topological code, it can be any quantum code, uh, such that uh, it is defined by sequence of measurements. And uh, then the logical information has to be guaranteed to be preserved. And also we have to be able to infer the information that would allow us to correct errors or to cool down the system. Basically, we would still want to keep measuring the stabilizers of the, of the code, the corresponding code. Okay, so now comparing Floquet codes to regular stabilizer codes, which people have been doing in quantum information forever, is the difference is that now there is not a concept of a stabilizer group one stabilizer group for a code. In fact, the stabilizer group can be different from round to round of measurements. In particular, the measurements enter the stabilizer group. So like it clearly evolves from round to round. Next, uh, error correction occurs differently because now we sort of like infer stabilizers from anti-commuting measurements. Yes. So technically, technically it is isomorphic, but it, it could be embedded into some, some, some larger objects and then the larger object could be isomorphic. It, it's a good question. Yes, yes. But, but you could, could imagine going like to, yeah, yeah, it's, it's sort of like you perform an isomorphism, but I think there could be something, something larger than that. Yeah. Um, okay, and then, uh, yeah, and then uh, this, what I call features, is really how you do quantum computation. So in stabilizer code, quantum computation is usually, usually done by applying unitaries, which, which would correspond to the global symmetries of the code that would perform operational logical states. 
Uh, and uh, there are, all, are also other different tricks like lattice surgery, which allows to manipulate logical information by manipulating the boundaries and cuts and pulling things together. And there is also other like very uh, useful tools like magic state gate distillation, which allows you to get the universal gate set, which is needed for full quantum advantage to the act to actual universal quantum computation. And in comparison for K codes, that has not been explored as much, but what has been shown is that there are automorphisms which already tells us that logical information is doing something in trivial. And I will cover it in more detail soon. Yeah. Could you say a bit more about what you mean by the error correction for K-codes? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so so we also have to provide a guarantee that if you encode, if you start, if you initialize the system in, in logical state, that you will be able to recover the same logical states later on, despite certain probability, despite finding probability of errors, for example, during the revolution. So in order to give such a guarantee, we have to give a prescription of how we would correct the errors or like some other argument, maybe it's the discipline on the side of it, right? And uh, so for, for K codes, it would, uh, it would amount to considering the space-time evolution and showing that uh, for each, uh, instance of code, we know the values of stabilizers, it's instantaneous stabilizers, and then we re-measure these or we invert the values of these stabilizers periodically in time, so that we can use, like, if, if the value of the stabilizer has changed, we can tell that the error has, an odd number of errors has occurred in between these time steps. So we basically keep inferring information that would later allow us to um, correct the errors. So you don't give any additional measurements to recover the syndrome, right? Yeah, syndrome is already contained within the measurements that are used to define the code itself. And like in the case of the honeycomb code, yeah, in the case of the honeycomb code shown on the right, it's just two body measurements, but the plaquettes are six body of ranges that are just obtained by combining these measurements together in a particular way. Okay, yeah, so, sure. Uh -huh, sure. I think someone asked us about the lab between maybe different time sequence. And you say this mode is in, which is a structure preserving map and yeah. even larger. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a bit it's a bit speculative. So right now the way right now we approach it, it will always be an isomorphism between the child theory. Yeah. But in reality it can be isomorphism between the child theory and part of some larger oh, child theory. Like that's what's map at smaller one as well. If you can back both both larger one. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, definitely, definitely. But I don't think it's interesting to go to a small one from the perspective of quantum authority because you probably, like in some sense, will lose that confirmation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so. so you in, say a few words about syndrome here, just to, to order. Oh, yeah. When I say error syndrome, it just means that whenever stabilizer changes sign, that's the event I'm interested in. And that tells me that there has been an odd number of errors that anti commuted the stabilizer that occurred between the two subsequent measurements. And like these collective data of every change in the stabilizer values throughout time is what's called error syndrome. And that's just the information that is used in order to uh, perform error correction later. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first one kick that was proposed in 2021. So it's been actually, since the publication of that paper, it's been less than two years, but apparently there already exists a history of okay, codes. Uh, time flies by. Okay, and uh, yeah, so there has been a lot of uh, pretty good works in this domain, and most of these works are really QI. Uh, so people have been coming up with new examples and they have benchmarked the honeycomb code performance against regular um, surface code. And then they uh, have studied all these kinds of interesting properties. I think the most interesting one is this automorphism of the honeycomb codes. And there have been a couple of um, points addressed in quantum computation with 4K codes. These methods are sort of um, borrowed from how you would normally do quantum computation with the Tori code. In a sense, you could also do lattice surgery or you can do uh, twist effect grading, for example. And this is what has been addressed in these papers. But yeah, but largely, uh, there are really serious open questions in this field. Specifically, what Floquet code really is, is not still well defined, and we don't really know the, like, where the boundaries are. Uh, another thing is that we still don't know what the capacities of Floquet codes are. We don't know like whether uh, the certain non-go theorems apply to them, 
or if we can modify existing follicles in order to be able to overcome certain nodal theorems. And lastly, we don't know how to put them, with, like how to deal with founders and follicles. Um, that, that's our, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, for nodal theorem, like it's nil, uh, yeah, for inverse quantification. Yeah. Again, you say the same theorem plus the nodal theorem. Oh, yeah. So, that, so for stabilizer code, for pulp stabilizer codes, in a, um, it is not in a given dimension. Uh, it's the nil theorem tells you that you cannot have a transversal universal gate set in the same code, meaning that a single code framework cannot be used in order to perform universal quantum computation. So, you have to borrow tools that are not native to stabilizer code, like framework in order to be able to do universal quantum computation. But the point of the entire quantum information, quantum correction is to be able to do universal quantum computation. So here, there is a bunch of nodal theorems that make it complicated to actually do universal quantum computation using the code that actually protects information. On one hand, we really want to protect information, right? Because otherwise we just lose it and there's no information to manipulate. But on the other hand, we want to manipulate it in a universal way. Otherwise it's not different from classical computation. I'm oh, sorry, do you say like stabilizer code itself and cannot implement universal quantum computation? Uh, it's not the stabilizer code that cannot implement. It's it doesn't, there does not exist a uh, set of finite depth local unitaries that simultaneously form a basis for universal gate set. Right. I mean, there's a Fibonacci 0, 0 type of code that's a stabilizer code, but you, you can still do universal quantum computation, I suppose, almost. Um, I don't know what it is. Fibonacci are universal like grading, but it, I'm not sure if it can be like it, it's 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 not so it, yeah it's not fun that block grading to get you use in order to do grading. I think okay. I think that's the caveat. Yeah. Uh, you really need to move them like very very large distance. Oh. Like like you have to keep them separate and then you have to break them, which means that cannot be done by short unitary, right? You oh. have to you have to perform the minimum unitary operations. To do that, it's 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 about the like how much it takes to do the operation. Right? Yeah. So nothing is said about taking really long circuits, really deep circuits. But that also is bad because it's like it takes really long time. It's really hard to do that. And yeah, and I just wanted to highlight the papers which I feel like. Uh, so these are the papers that, yeah, make the most significant conceptual progress in the field. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, start by just stating our results and then I'm going to keep explaining them in, in, in a few layers, basically. So, um, yeah, so before, before I explain our results, I have to say that there exists a way of looking at whole codes from perspective of any conversation. For this one, I have to really fix a parent theory. So there has to exist like a parent code or parent theory from which we will be assuming each child code will be obtained by condensation. But then uh, each such condensation corresponds to, on a lattice, corresponds to a measurement operation. And in fact, it can be done by uh, low weight measurements. And then it just happens that, like, which, which, which is something no one understands really well, that the same measurement that you perform from parent theory to obtain a child theory, a one, and uh, so you have a parent theory and you have child theory one and child theory two. So for many cases, when this, um, yeah, so, so there is measurement one and measurement two that you perform to get these two theories, the same measurements can be obtained to go between the child theories. So which we sort of call like a condensation from one theory to another, but in reality, there is like this virtual parent theory um, like happening in the background. Yeah, so, and then um, in the language of topological codes, we would, we would be able to uh, specify a sequence of condensation from one child theory to another. And then uh, such a uh, periodic sequence of condensation could be turned into periodic sequence of measurements to define the Fouquet code. And that would realize that topological state and, uh, yeah, and the corresponding code. Okay, so, Sorry, sure. Do this, do the child theories have, have the same topological order? Can they, be, can they have different cases uh, of mapping? So we don't know such examples. And we, we know that these transition from our understanding currently is that it has to be an isomorphism. So if you go between different topological order, in reality, like the second topological order will be reduced in the sense that you fix a sector of it or something. 
Um, yeah, and like, oh, and also, yeah, may, maybe I have to state here. So for example, honeycomb code can be thought of as a sequence of ending conversations. So if you pick a parent, which is two copies of a Tory code, which we call a color code because it's just a very convenient model for two copies, lattice model for two copies of the Tory code. So if you take a parent, which is two copies of the Tory code, honeycomb code is a sequence conversation from that to the Tory code. And there are several ways to condense two copies of the Tory code to, down to Tory code, and you just follow one path. And it turns out there exists um, non-trivial paths and honeycomb code is an example of such path. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so I think the main result of our work is that uh, we generalize this concept of these non-trivial condensation paths to a general class that we call, general class of codes or models that we call dynamic automorphism codes. So specifically, if you choose a uh, arbitrary parent model, and in our work, we sort of uh, only can address a billion models. Uh, and uh, you, you, again, you choose what kind of child model you want to start with, and then each next model will be isomorphic to it. Uh, then you can construct an object that is called condensation graph. And the condensation graph is a set of isomorphic child models. And whenever there exists a uh, transition, which we call reversible, which means it uh, preserves logical information between the two child theories. This is when an edge connects two child theories on the graph. And then once we have this graph, we can draw cycles on this graph and each cycle will be, uh, it, will, it will be possible to use each cycle in order to define a different Fokke code or dynamic code. And moreover, we can uh, follow an irregular path, which will not be Fokke anymore because it's not periodic, but it's still a legal path. And then it turns out that like, if you compare the state of the system uh, at the beginning and after you follow a closed loop, uh, what can happen, you come back to the same model, but you could have applied automorphism. So in fact, every closed cycle is labeled by an automorphism. Then, um, and that, that motivates us to call these models dynamic automorphism codes because uh, you, you can choose cycles, you can choose sequences of cycles moreover, and you, that will implement a sequence of automorphism on your logical state or on your model. Okay, so why would one care about it? And again, the motivation is quantum info motivation. It's because um, Automorphism correspond to logic gates or to logical operation on your quantum information in QI. So if you are able to do enough automorphism, you are able to do quantum computation. So in fact, what's happening is that as you unravel your code in time, you also perform quantum computation. So these become part of the same process. You just need to choose the measurement sequence generating your code appropriately and that same sequence that defines the code itself and that protects logical information itself will also be the sequence responsible for the quantum computation meaning manipulation of that logical information yeah so uh, what is meant by a model here is it just some complex yeah here here it, it's a double edge code that is like we want it to be the one that is realizable in the last quantum time so the right one is one one Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is not obvious, but I'm gonna talk about it for the rest of the talk. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and okay, and uh, another thing that we did in our paper, we uh, produced uh, very explicit examples. In two dimension, our example is called uh, dynamic automorphism color code. And it's a code that has, uh, so color code is uh, isomorphic to two copies of the Tory code. And that has 72 automorphisms. And um, yeah, and uh, for quantum info, it means that uh, once you uh, set up the code properly, like with proper boundaries, you can actually perform the full clip regroup. And in three dimensions, we proposed a three dimensional dynamic automorphism color code uh, that is like generalization to 3D which has an additional automorphism that actually exchanges, uh, uh, that corresponds to like exchanging magnetic fluxes with magnetic flux time SPT uh, excitation um, and or pulsation charge. Uh, and uh, from perspective of quantum computation that corresponds to complementing our ability to do gates by an ability to do an unclifford gate. And if you are able to do all Clifford gates, supplementing this by one 
other gates outside of the Clifford group uh, would be sufficient to generate a universal gate set. So if uh, these two uh, possibilities to compute without the marking are combined together, that would give universal quantum computation. And so in our paper, we sort of focused on the error correcting side of it. We showed that these are error correcting codes and uh, yeah, and together this, this would be a universal gate set, but you would need to convert between two dimensions and three dimensions. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of where we stopped because we sort of achieved everything we wanted for quantum computing. So now, um, yeah, now going more in depth. So how do we obtain honeycomb code from any condensation and why does the automorphism happen in the honeycomb code? Because this is the simplest example of what can happen in 4K codes. So honeycomb code, yeah, as I said, for the honeycomb code, the parent model is two copies of the Tori code. But if you want to do things efficiently in the lattice, you really want to deal with the color code. Color code is just a very convenient representation of it. And um, yeah, it has been noticed in this paper that, uh, uh, yes, that the honeycomb code can be obtained by condensing anions of the color code. So in the color code, uh, we arrange the bosons um, into a bottom table. There are total nine bosons, and then they can be labeled by um, color and polyflavor. Color is like a microscopic information about the boson. And uh, these can be put in correspondence with the bosons of two copies of the Tori code. So the first, uh, item here is uh, the uh, boson, the first copy of the Tori code, the second one and the second copy of the Tori code. And for example, there is a boson that corresponds to a product of the fermions in the two copies of the Tori code. So uh, why do people arrange it this way? It's because it's very convenient to see the fusion breaking rules for bosons from here. Uh, for example, for uh, any, uh, any two bosons in the same row, fuse to the third one. Similarly, any two bosons in the same column fuse to the third one. And uh, if you want to, yeah, so it, it's also sort of obvious from the poly, for example, with rules like X times Y equals Z, but it's even, sorry, it's even more obvious if you just look at the Tori codes, that product of two objects in the same row gives you the third object in the same row. Similarly with braiding, uh, there is a guarantee that uh, for every object in, in, the, in for, for every object, the object in the same row and in the same column braid trivially, Whereas the objects uh, here will braid with minus one with five phase. And um, yeah, and similarly, you can see it very easily from, from the two copies of the Tori code sign. But it's just more convenient to label things like color codes because once we go um, to our examples, we will just like, we'll have more copies of the Tori code as a parent code. And it's much easier to follow just like, like a single index for the color code for each color code copy than to, to like twice more indices for the copies of the chart codes. Okay, so a uh, honeycomb code then amounts to condensing. Uh, so so th there are three child models. One is obtained by taking a color code and condensing Rx boson. Another is uh, obtained by taking color code and condensing GY boson. And the third one is by D. And in fact, you can also transition from one child model to another by just condensing the same boson sort of like virtually starting from the one child model and you can go to the next one. So you start by, you say from the parents model, you condense Rx and then you condense GY, then you condense BC and then you come back to the same, the same child model. And that will be the honeycomb code. But after performing the cycle, you will actually implement an EM automorphism. Okay, so how do we see this EM automorphism? Um, okay, so here I need to slow down. So please feel free to, yeah, to stop me and ask any questions because yeah. Um, um. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, right. Hi, Max. Do I have a question? Uh, question? Sorry. Uh, so, so once you condense an anion, right? How, how uh -huh. do you. And it seems like unrecoverable. Yes, that's it, it's only like it only makes sense from perspective of the parent theory. Only if you view it as if the parent theory is there. Uh, you condense it, you, you have to decon. So, so you have a confined, the next anion you're trying to condense will be the one that is confined. And what you do, you really, you have to gauge it back to the parent theory and then you can condense for the parent theory. So from perspective of condensation, you really have to invoke the parent theory every time. And we don't know how to get away without it. But from perspective of microscopic, something interesting happens is that we know that, um, for example, this condensation occurs when you measure like x, x operators on all edges. 
And then starting from like, say this child code, child code three, for example, and measuring XX edges does both. It does, it both does gauging to the parent theory and it does condensation to the, uh, engaging to the parent theory, sorry. And it does condensation to the, to the next child theory. So both like by trying to implement this condensation. So, so you can either start from parent theory and condense this Rx in order to get this, this child theory, but you also could have started from something that looks to you on the lot just like a condensed child, other condensed child theory. And you could perform measurement that you think should be condensing this, um, uh, this uh, the, the same boson in the parent theory. And it will, it will somehow perform both, both will lift to the parent code and then will condense back to the new child code. And really what's happening is that you're trying to condense a new object that does not break trivially with the, the previously condensed object, right? So it's sort of, it's, it's, yeah, so it confines the previously condensed object, but now it condenses the new object. It's, 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 yeah, we don't have very good uh, understanding of what's happening actually from this perspective. We only have a good understanding from perspective of parent code. But we just know that a lot is we can just go between child theories without problem. So the condensation is done by measuring some set of uh, some set, set of stabilizers or operators. Is that well, probably a, like hopping operators actually. Yeah, yeah, and these don't commute between rounds. Yeah, so, um, okay, so let, let us see what happens if we actually do this cycle. So at first round, I'm gonna say that I want to condense our X operator starting with the color code that corresponds to condensing the uh, M boson in the second copy of the Tori code. That means that this operator together with the old vacuum together form an equivalence class, which will be the new vacuum. So now uh, one and our X will be the equivalence class that forms the new vacuum and I call it vacuum prime. Okay, so now, um, now all the rest of onions in the color code will become equivalence classes under fusion with what we call the new vacuum, right? So R1 and RZ were the operators that were related by fusion with Rx and they, they will have to become the same anion now. And similarly, GX and BX will have to become the same anion now. Let's call this one E and this one M. And what I'm gonna be doing now, let me follow the evolution of the original E anion as I labeled it through, through the sequence of condensations, okay? So at the next step, I'm gonna instead try to condense GY uh, after condensing, G oh, sorry. And I probably have to say that the rest of anions that are not E or not effective E and not effective M anions, they have to be confined because they braided them trivially with Rx and uh, nothing can braid them trivially with the vacuum with in the new child theory. Now we are trying to condense an object that was confined uh, within the parent theory. So we start from the parent theory again, and we come next step with condensed UI. And what happens is that these operators together, RY and BY and GX and GZ will now become our new, uh, it doesn't matter what to label them, but let me label them, for example, uh, E to prime and M to prime. Uh, okay, and then, uh, we see that uh, there exists a shared representative Ry between E prime and E two prime. So that representative will be inherited to next round. That's why I say that the logical information is conserved. It's because the strings of these anions around homological and trivial cycles generate logical operators. And the fact that some one string is inherited from round to round means that the logical information is concerned. So I want to inherit a single at least one representative in the language of parent theory from one round to another for the logical information to be conserved. And similarly, this representative GX is inherited between rounds. Okay, and the next step we condense BZ. And similarly, this will become, for example, and um, let me call this E to three, to three primes and let me call this M three primes. Uh, and uh, the uh, operator that was, uh, Give me just a second. So the operator that uh, was Ry, it will be in the same equivalence class in the previous round as an operator. Yeah, let me actually write this out. So the first round I had uh, one Rx, so it was my vacuum. Uh, and uh, Ry, Rz was my uh, E prime and uh, Gx, Bx was my M prime. 
In the second round, this is first round, the second round, the third round. In the second round, I had uh, one GUI menu vacuum. And um, RYBY, sorry, will be my uh, E2. And uh, GX, GZ will be my M2. Okay, and then now third round, I will have uh, one BZ be my new vacuum. Um, RZGZ will be my new, sorry, E3, and VXBY uh, will, be, will be my new M3. And then I will go back to one. Okay, and now let me follow the, uh, let me change the color of this, sorry. Um, so now let me follow the, the E prime operator through this evolution. So at first it is here, it is RZ. Okay, in the next step, in, in next step RZ does not appear in, in any of the deconfined anions, but RY does. And RY is in the same equivalence class. So RY is the, so, R, R, so, so what happens to RZ is that we can, we, we say that it is equivalent to RY. RY survives to the next round. And it, it will be the uh, E that has been inherited to the next round. Now we want to see what happens to RY in third round. Uh, so in third round, we don't have RY in fact, but we can first turn, turn RY by fusing it with the condensed object to BY. So we turn it into BY and BY survives to the next round. This is where it goes. And then similarly, BY does not survive to the next round. It does not commute with the condensation of the next round. So instead we transform it into BX and BX is what survives to the next round and it will be this object. And so after a round of transformations, we turned E to M and similarly we will turn M to E. So what happens is that we exchange E and M strings or E and M anions after a full round of evolution. So this is how it morphism occurs. We sort of pick up the object that we condense along the path until we picked up an entire fermion and we multiply this uh, in M string, in an M operated by a fermion. And that, that's why the EM atomorphism occurs. So basically by having to um, care, care about how each anion is uh, inherited from round to round, we always look at what this anion looks like as an equivalence class in the current theory. And we have to find the overlap between the two rounds every time. But then it turns out that when while well between two rounds, you can always label things consistently. Once you perform a cycle, there is no way to label the same anion consistently. You come back to a different anion. And it doesn't matter what you label things between rounds. It's only is important that like uh, you come back to the same point and the label will have to change. And that's that's how it's more things occur, really. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's it's arbitrary labeling, really. Yeah, you, you could, but uh, yeah, if, if I if I swap the label, it doesn't change rates. So so I can swap the label rates. I guess I have to follow the E. Yeah. Uh, if I do that, nothing changes still. Uh, look, it it is okay. So look, I it's it's E E E, but then it will have to be M in round one again. Right. Oh, yeah, there's no, I would have to change my labeling in order for it to stay. So yeah, so it doesn't matter what you call things. If the naming is arbitrary. It's important that like, if you fix the naming of the first round and you perform a loop, naming has already been fixed, but your particle will change. Yeah, so it's it's like, it's, I could have not even labeled anything. I would have, I could have just said that I have these equivalence classes, right? And I could have followed it and I would see that my, the, the, the belonging to which equivalence class it belongs will change. No. Sorry, why are there just uh, nine bosons? Oh, so the rest, the rest are six fermions? Yeah, yeah. there are six fermions as well. Um, yeah, okay, and yeah, and there's also vacuum. There are 10 right, in bottom section. Um, yeah, okay, and then, um, so, and then it turns out that, uh-huh. I just understand the bosons and automobilism after the round of BZ, condensed BZ, sorry, RX, BY, and BZ, mm -hmm. subsequent order. 
but, but what, what is the second mean in a, in a implementation of this code? What, how do you, you know, not naively, you probably have some domain rule, right? So No, no, you can, you can condense, it's, it's a temporal domain rule in our case. You could also do it spatially, but in our case, it's temporal, so you condense everywhere at once. Right. So uniformly. So these are, I mean, the domain rule is high on yeah. the right. So yeah. what, how, how do common conversational people or computer people like do implement this on the data? By measurements. By you measure point. the hopping operator, and that adds the hopping operator to the stabilizer group. But remember, the stabilizer group corresponds to the Hamiltonian that, that determines what your ground state space is and the code space is. And once you add these hopping operators to the Hamiltonian uh, with large prefactor, right? It kicks out everything that did not commute with these hopping operators, but also hopping operators acquire an expectation value of whatever you measure them to be. And that means that your, your boson acquires an expectation value. Yeah, so so just measuring these operators adds them to civilizer group and then forces them to connect. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, okay, and so since there are more than three bottles, in fact, there are more than more than one option of what to like what like of condensation sequence starting from the color code. In fact, if we just now now we sort of rearrange the um, boson table for the color code in a way that now if you uh, go like there, there, the sorry the edge on this graph is drawn whenever uh, going from one theory to another you can then something that it was confined you can add something that rated not trivially and that is needed in order to conserve logic information so now the edges on this graph so so now the bosons are rearranged here and the edges of this ground are drawn such that following the edges in the graph you follow the path of condensations where the logical information is preserved. So now I can draw any closed path on this graph. And this is a torus, in fact, so it's periodic. So I can uh, draw any graph, uh, any path on the graph, and I will uh, that will define a legal Floquet code. And in fact, what we found is that while each graph like this defines a legal Floquet code, not each graph defines an error correcting code. So there is some additional like UV information that goes into things in error correcting that is not captured by this point of view. And this is quite curious. And um, another thing is that whenever you, uh, your cycle that you draw on this graph, so as I said, every cycle on the, this is a condensation graph, right? So every cycle on this graph is labeled labeled by an automorphism. And in fact, if this uh, cycle is an untrivial cycle around the torus, it's either this or that. Uh, it will implement EM automorphism of the Tori code. And if the uh, um, cycle is contractible, it will actually be a trivial automorphism. So there is this interesting like tor emerging Tori code on the top of the condensation graph. So by not being air correcting code, that means that it doesn't eventually render the plaquettes. Yes, or it does measure plaquettes, but it just does not measure them regularly enough such that you would be able to guarantee a correction. In fact, like for this specific code, you just need to measure plaquettes periodically in order to all, all of the plaquettes periodically. But for more complicated examples, like the dynamic codes that we construct in our work, we found that there is like, there seems to exist a cellular condition on that. It's not just measuring plaquettes frequently. It's really, it really even cannot be formulated anymore in the language of measuring plaquettes frequently enough. It has to be formulated in a space-time way. In fact, you have to say that you have a space-time objects that like the product of which gives you plus one. And then if that space-time object is violated, then you get, have an error. So unless we actually invoke space-time picture, we can't even formulate error correction in more complicated codes anymore. Yeah. There's a graph that's uh... Yeah, so so yeah, so the two cycles that I drew are error correcting. But if I, for example, like a trivial trivial example would be just going back and forth between two two things that want to be error correcting. And if yeah, I think that's sort of all I can oh I think one more I can I can show one more example actually. If I only go between two colors, right? So I keep going like this. Uh, like this, I think, in a staggered way. Sorry. Yeah. So if I keep going in a staggered way, such that uh, red color never occurs, I think I think that also is not very correct. But, but this uh, path will still perform. Like, 
country there are a lot of uh, I think this one I can I can't tell actually it looks like it a Dane twist it looks like a Dane twist to me so I don't know actually it cycles around both so what both directions I think I think it might both. be I think it's an identity yeah so an open question like you're saying that it needs to be expert data an open question like what the, from this picture you have what in the middle of it is uh, yes like physical interpretation in terms of okay precisely yeah yeah that that's an open question we don't we just don't know. So the open question is like, uh, so we have this picture for constructing codes from condensation sequences, but we don't know what is the minimal ingredient that needs to be added to guarantee error correction, the ability to correct errors or to cool your system down. Yeah. Uh, so for our codes, we, we, we have specific explicit constructions. So for those constructions, we actually addressed it and we, we sort of like tried to construct the full base itself based on the vectors and show that it like fills the entire space time, right? But um, yeah, but for general code, we don't even know where to get started. Yeah. And how do you figure out whether it's error correct or not? You have to show that you have a full basis of the vectors and then you either, you would normally either do statistical mechanics argument uh, that you map it into like a random one Biden model and show that there is a finite temperature transition and that maps into final finite error probability transition or you show that there exists a matching decoder that would give you a threshold. Yeah. Okay, this one is like you can use a cycle of the vector. Mm -hmm. This one is error correcting and the threshold has been shown both both analytically and numerically. Oh, so, so to make sure I'm the parallel expression. Uh -huh. Just in this case, it's equivalent to saying as long as you have all three colors, you're good. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm not sure about yellow. Okay. I think that doesn't have to be like cyclically red, blue, green, red, blue, green. No, I know that these these examples that are just like these horizontal lines. Mm -hmm. This this kind of line and those other lines, these are guaranteed to be error correcting. I'm not sure about that most general thing that passes through all three colors. I think that might not be error correcting. Uh, yeah, we actually sort of addressed that in our first paper that I'm not citing here. Um, we we sort of like we're trying to come up with a criterion for if, what if you take your next step randomly? What would be the criterion for your code to be error correcting? And we sort of came up with like what we call finite uh, probabilistic autom automaton. So basically, it's a little machine with memory that is checking whether you're losing error syndrome. And for this, it has to refer to its memory. And like, like once it starts running out of memory, it forces you to perform a measurement that will make sure that you like updated your error syndrome accordingly and that it keeps going. So you can keep like doing things even randomly, like choosing like a path of the graph randomly, but like you check for error correction. But it really is sort of like, I would say it's still ad hoc, right? To sort of like just double check that you are acquiring error syndrome and not like erasing it instead, which is possible actually, because here things don't commute. So you are, you you are sort of bound to occasionally erase the information about forget before inferring its value again, such that it could be used to the nerve syndrome. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you're implementing the auto sorry, just automorphism of the color probe, which is a full copy of a digital recall. Yeah. And they are 72 out of 72. So, so this is a Tori code we're looking okay. at. Yeah, this is the Tori code, right? We start from a color code, the parent code, but code realized that every instance in time here is a Tori code, and Tori code has only one automorphism, so that's what we have here. Okay. Yeah, but soon I will be talking about our example that we construct in our paper, okay. and that's the color code, and there we get 72 automorphisms. Okay. So right now it's just the hissing saga. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so now I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> um, Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So our idea was that uh, that yeah, this automorphism was interesting, but it wasn't clear. N no one really looked at it that closely, and it wasn't clear if you can construct more of those and why these occur, and like yeah, and if you can get useful automorphisms or examples of of plaque codes or dynamic codes that will have many of those. And so the idea is that uh, what if we take just a, some general large parent model such that it's child models, like a set of isomorphic child models, you look at any child models and it has many automorphisms. The question is like, is it possible to get uh, like all the automorphisms of a child model? And 
it's sort of um, by looking at copies of the Torah code, it looks to us like you can like by specifying the by finding the condensation graph, you will find all the atomorphisms. But again, we don't know how to show that. We don't know how to show the guarantee that you're uh, guaranteed to find like cycles corresponding to all the atomorphisms of the child theory. So right now we just know that empirically. And for example, that we constructed, we were able to find all the atomorphisms, but we don't know if that's true in general. But the idea would be to uh, start with a given parent code, uh, find a condensation graph from this parent code to set up as a morphic child theories. Hopefully there will be many. And then uh, on this condensation graph, label all the cycles and see which automorphism we can get. And also the working code form group so you can stack them on top of each other as well. And yeah, and hopefully it will be also useful for quantum computation. And again, just to explain it maybe a little bit better. So the transition between two child theories is allowed whenever we say that the logical information is conserved. So we call that transition reversible, meaning we can go back and forth without losing logical information. What it really means is that if you take the parent theory M and you go to both of these child theories, uh, like say you say you separate them spatially and learn time wise, the domain wall between these two child theories will be vertical. So for each rep anion representative, we'll find uh, an anion on, on each side, basically. Uh, so each anion of one theory can pass through this domain wall. And that, that is what we need in order to guarantee that the full set of logical operators for a quantum code will actually survive from one to round. And that guarantees survival of logical information as well. So going like to, so having the invertible domain walls also guarantees that we have, uh, yeah, so that logical information survives. So to summarize the known examples, so the honeycomb code is this example. And um, yeah, so the parent model for it is the color code, which is two copies of the Torah code. The child model is the Torah code, and it will be just a different microscopic colonization of the Torah code each step. And then uh, it's, the model is like once put it on a proper condensation graph, you find that you are able to do all the automorphisms on the toric code. And then finally, for quantum combination, sort of useless because it's a one contrived gate that is not, not very useful. Okay, so then this is, the rest are the examples we come up uh, in our work. So uh, the first very explicit example is the color code generalization of the honeycomb code. So what if the child was the color code or two copies of the toric code? And the difference between color code and two copies of the Torah code is that on the lattice uh, in color code, tor that these copies of the Torah code are coupled. And that is actually very important for our construction to work, to work for specifically for automorphisms to, to, uh, to be enabled. So the parent model for this code is actually just four copies of the Torah code or two copies of the color code. And then uh, the automorphisms that we are able to obtain are all the automorphisms of the color code. And I'll explain later why there are 72 of them. Yeah. I'm a little confused why the microscopic aspect of them being, you know, um, handled uh -huh. on that scale uh -huh. is important at the high level discussion. You know, what yeah, so for, for high level discussion, like it's, it's sort of, it's implicitly in there. Uh, the reasoning is the following. So in order to get Torah codes, you sort of, kill the extra Tory codes and that's all you do. So you can condense independent simple simple objects from your original theory and you can get two to the couple of Tory codes. That's how you get to two Tory codes. Now if you want to get to a color code, uh, you know that microscopic code is coupled, but what does it mean for the QFT? It actually means that you want to condense our composite objects. It's product of different anions within different Tory codes. And these are the objects that you condense. And that's why the resulting um, anions will be also composite anions from perspective of the parent model. And of course, it is, again, are arbitrary to which objects you call composites and which you call simple, right? So you could have relabeled and my two copies of Tory codes would be put for the color code, but it's important that they just choose labeling at the beginning within the parent model. And I say, I have four decoupled copies of the Tory code, say. And then once I start condensing composite objects with their products, this is how I get a color code. So that, that's, that's a helpful to ask your question. Yeah. Sorry, can I think of the parent model as, as a subsystem code? And we no, that's our first paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so like the first paper that we wrote, the same team basically of people, uh, that we wrote on Flokekos was uh, the point that we were trying to make is that um, subsystem codes are do not provide good parent codes for Flokekos. Just to like for other people's sake, subsystem codes are just 
not commuting version of stabilizer codes, codes, and they just define actually a family of codes that you can get from a single subsystem code. And people naturally as used to assume that indeed you could get like um, like okay codes from just like like choosing a proper subsystem code from quantum mechanics. But then it turned out that you could easily like you could show that for example th this example the honeycomb code this generalization to this lattice actually does not fit in the subsystem code framework at all already yeah so so it, any organization seems to be better but we also don't know if it's the end to all as well yeah then we also address the question of what we if we have like prime dimensional copy oh yeah and also from perspective of quantum computation since it's two dimensions what we actually get is clifford group and then uh, we go further and we consider just more general two-dimensional dynamic automorphism codes where we start from stacks of uh, prime dimensional toric codes. In this case, we also can show that uh, it just works by analogy. Um, but we actually did not classify all the possible automorphisms. So that's sort of an open question, which automorphisms you get in general, we don't know. We just know that you get some. And we know if we have like a general prescription of how to find an automorphism given a path and a condensation graph, but we don't know how to find which what is the set of all automorphisms you can get. So why do you have to think of the automorphisms if you already have examples where it was a correctable yeah. error correcting code, right? Mm -hmm. You call it code example, mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. where you didn't have an automorphism. I we we got all of that. And you told me that it's like a contractible yeah. subject. It was still a good code, a good subject code, but there's no automorphism. Uh, yeah, if it's a contractible, yes, you can have uh, an example would be what we call a CSS clinical code, CSS version basically. It's period six version that is error correct. Yeah. Okay, so just make sure I understand. In that case, for example, there's no morphism, but it still works just as good. Yes, code. absolutely. So, yeah, well, why the emphasis on morphism? Just because it's an interesting structure to get, or do you think there's a relation to error correction? Yeah, so I don't think there is relation to error correction. So first of all, it's an interesting structure. And second of all, your code performs computation. So right, because you, you can choose, and yeah, I can give you a sequence of gates, that will be a quantum algorithm, right, of quantum computation. And you can give me back a sequence of measurements that will not only be code itself, it will also guarantee that starting from a given logical state, it will also always apply this computation by the time you finish running your code. So you embed quantum computation into the choice of the specific code you, you choose. So it's a way of embedding quantum computation inside a measure of space code. I don't understand all that. So, so in the in the honeycomb in the honeycomb model, um, if we are doing this single automorphism uh -huh. that we have, is it like equivalent to just applying the Hadamard on the logical operators. It's Hadamard swap of logical operators, in fact, because, because you also have to rotate. I see, because okay. you just exchange X yeah. and D logical yeah. operators. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think it's actually a very important point. It was a very good question. So I think, so the point is that each automorphism corresponds to a logical gate, right? So imagine if I give you like a sequence of logical gates that I want you to implement at every given point in time. So that is the definition of, and if it's done on n logical qubits and a large number of logical qubits, that's the definition of what quantum computation is. Well, but now for each automorphism, if, if I'm able to do automorphisms that correspond to each of these logical gates, then for example, we know that there are examples where you can get, get a big, large number of logical gates, right? So for example, for our dynamic automorphism color code, we can get all Clifford gates, which means that for any Clifford gate, I can find a, a path of condensation that will give corresponding automorphism. So, and path of condensations will usually be order of one one. Oh, I see. So the quantum computation column is referring to the automorphism column, not just about stuff you can do with the Oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is quantum computation means what you can get from automorphisms. Yeah, this is really important. Yeah, so, so it's the same, actually. Yeah, yeah. So gates and automorphisms is the same thing here. It's, it's like we're, we are doing quantum computation by picking which exactly path we're following. So each path will correspond, and then it means that each path in the condensation graph will correspond to different quantum computation performed to your logical information. And it means that, yeah, so so just, so, so a sequence of gates, if I have a good enough dynamic code, 
it means that it will be a sequence of automorphisms of that code. Um, and that sequence of automorphisms can be translated into sequence of measurement sequence, measurement sequence one, and each measurement sequence will be length, uh, short length. For example, for our code, we showed that we can get any of 72 automorphisms by uh, condensation sequences of length under five uh, rounds. So you, you do under five rounds and you get any automorphism. So then, then you, you choose the like, like what exactly is the sequence of sequences? And that guarantees that quantum computation for you. And ideally, this is how we would want to do quantum computing. Yeah. And then in 3D, so, so what we lack here from quantum computation perspective is an automorphism corresponding to an amplitude gate. And in 3D, we can get that for almost free. Yeah. Um, for the 72 automorphisms of the color code, what's the minimum number of automorphisms you need to, uh, to perform the full uh, Three. three. Oh. The, there are three generators. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get back just yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Ramji, question. But you made a very nice point that I really like about the yeah, just using automatic to do gates. Can uh -huh. you explain why I don't want to do the other stuff that I usually think about if you have a story code? I apply some string operators to apply logical. Gates. Yeah. Why don't you want to use those extra things? Yeah, so so you you could. It's it's more like a question of a preference of what you'd like to do. Because if you have like a so here one example is if you have a measurement based platform like fusion-based quantum computation or topological quantum computer, then your native operations are measurements. Mm -hmm. And then you just would prefer to not apply unitaries. And another example is, since you already know, you have to like, remember how I started, I said like uh, that uh, measurements are, un are unavoidable, right? If you deal with error correction, you have to perform measurements. Then why also add other stuff on top of that, right? If you already have to do measurements, why not embed quantum computation in there? Why do we need to do anything else? And especially like with lattice surgery, oh, and also it has a big benefit over like lattice surgery and other things, because for lattice surgery, your uh, time of implementation of lattice surgery scales with the size of these uh, usual cuts and glue, the things that you glue. So it, it usually takes the time, that, the distance amount of time. And in this in case of topological codes, it would be order of L, right? Here you implement a gate after like a finite number of rounds. So it's much faster. And I, I feel like, Right now, at the current stage, we don't achieve that much more than usual color code can do or usual Tori code can do. But if we can scale this up and we can have a lot of logical qubits, what we what we really are doing is that if we run a really long computation and the computation doesn't tell the computation wanted to be order of L at least in order to, for it to be fault tolerant, you in principle because each automorphism takes only constant number of time, the overhead per gate will be a constant. So if we only were able to also have a large number of logical qubits, this will be the smallest overhead you could ever have. But it's like, then a question is like, can we also do this in more logical qubits? Yeah. When you say log fit, you said there is room, some twist defect, something like a- Twist defect, so it's another, another way. Uh, for lattice surgery, it's, it's really gluing patches together in a particular way, while applying gates sometimes at the, at the interface. That is it means going patch. Yes. Between yes. Um, between what? Between patches. different patches of toricos, for example. Okay. You, yeah. yeah. But, but that's also a way to say like twist feedback. It is somewhat similar, but it happens at the boundary. It's really manipulation of boundary and twist effects at the corners, maybe. Maybe that's a good way to say it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a few things to make sure. Mm -hmm. I think you say we can do the 72. Oh, there's a way to automorphism in the color code yeah. based on uh, wrong, wrong less than five. Yes, right? five or less. The previous example you showed us is wrong three. Is yes, okay. yes. But there are some more complicated cases go more than wrong three. Yes, okay. that's true. No, but what I showed was the, this first line, right? What I showed so far was I the honeycomb know. code, right? So it's it's different automorphism and it's like a smaller, simpler system. Yeah. yeah when you say like the last column, common computation, one gate means uh, is a one gate for two body the check? Is that the gate you're talking about? Oh, no, no. I just mean like this automorphism corresponds to a gate. Okay. I just did not want to specify it because it's just okay. a boring gate. Yeah. Okay. It's not important. So what, what, what? What is exactly? No, in fact, yeah. So for, for, for in order to actually do the error correction, um, 
it, it becomes immediately much harder. So in reality, we we're only able to show that um, we can have like three generators and we also have to actually pad them, like decorate them for additional measurements that fit in, the, in this framework as well, uh, we, which just implement identity gates basically. And then those like decorated measurement sequences are guaranteed to be error correcting, but that's the deficiency of our uh, uh, like our proof basically and not deficiency of the codes because in reality for each automorphism you have infinite number of ways to implement it in reality right and like uh, you could in principle theoretically search among them and find one that is error correcting we just don't know how that's exactly like uh, addresses Ruben's question is there a criterion we don't know that criterion so instead we were trying to come up with a constructive way of coming up with sequences that guarantee to be error correcting that's all. Yeah, and finally in 3D, yeah, sure. So here with, with all the last, last column. Uh -huh. So yeah, and so the, here, a quantum computation from automorphism. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, so this clipo group or non clipo gate, those are the, the some, some, some of the, you know, some of the implementation of matrix X on the logical qubit, right? Yes. And, what are the generators for those, those examples you can give for the Clipper group? Like yeah, for the Clipper group, the simplest. The from the, this, this example. For the Clipper group, group on n logical qubits, the simplest generators are a single qubit, like S and H gate. That's, I, I'm putting yeah. a sub subscript one. one no, 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 group. no, wait, that's not it. And then you have to also have entangling gates sure, between sure. a pair of qubits, and then you need to have it for every. For for this specific code, yes. Okay. Yes, because like here I'm saying we can do a full clipper group, okay. which means we can do all the generators for the group. Okay. Yes, that's right. Yeah, how about the non people get? Do you need to go to three body or two body? No, it's two body as well, but it's non clifford measurements actually. Oh, sorry, it's non poly clifford measurements, in fact. You cannot do this by polys. Okay. Yeah. That's the important part. Um, and also, moreover, you cannot, there is something interesting going on there. It's you cannot do this without actually like actively error correcting. You have to insert a round of error correction before doing a clipper gate, which is sort of unusual from microscopic specifically. I don't I don't know what it means from TQFT. From TQFT, it just means that the automorphism we're looking at is corresponds to the one that involves a this fluctuating charge or like a structure ring. Uh, so it's it just like a special automorphism that isn't current 2D, but occurs in 3D. But like from perspective of microscopy, somehow we get into the problem, we really have to uh, have to do a correction actively in order for it to even work in principle. Yeah, so in 3D, we, we just, yeah, basically generalize. So for the color code, you have to find it with this logical form? On, on the torus, yes. And, and how do you like scale it up? How do you add more? You just do the PC codes, honestly. <laughs> you no, in reality, you just do stack. You, you just do stacks of codes, and we don't do a torus. We like in actually in order to do actual quantum computation, you have to put it on a system with boundaries. In our case, it's specifically triangular boundaries, and you would just do stacks of them, and the, the stacks would be coupled. That's how you actually do it. That's how you actually scale it. But I don't think I think like in reality, what we want to achieve is not. Quantum computation, but color codes. We really want to move beyond toric code like things in the future. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm running out of time, right? So it's let me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe, but let me actually maybe not tell as many details. So I think the idea for the, yeah, the idea for the uh, automorphism of the color codes is that these are any permutation of anions that uh, preserve fusion and brain rules between them. And um, yeah, and so how to see that there are 72 of them is that actually like if we uh, assume that like uh, if we arrange them in this magic square and we assume that the fusion braiding come from the magic square and all the uh, fermions come from uh, fusion between the non-trivial uh, non braiding anions in this magic, uh, bosons in this magic square, uh, then uh, actual automorphisms are just the symmetries of this triangle, of this square. So if we can rearrange the bosons of the square such that uh, the uh, fusion and braiding rules will hold, so hold, 
uh, that would be that would be an illegal automorphism. Then there are 72 symmetries in this magic square. It's very easy to see. So that's how you see it. Uh, so yeah, so basically these are all, all legal permutations of any site with the preserved fusion gradient rules. So for dynamic automorphism color code, we start with these um, two copies. And yeah, let's let me actually not walk through the details of how exactly the automorphism occurs, but yeah, maybe like be at a little bit higher level. So what's happening is that we start with two copies of the color code, then I label all the anions in the first copy uh, with subscript one and in the second copy with subscript two. And then if I uh, condense anion in each color code separately, it's like having two copies of the honeycomb code. So I get two Tory codes that are independent from each other. And that's how I get these two decoupled copies of the Tory codes. And the way to get a color code from this is to condense composite bosons, which are products of bosons within the original parent theory. And that's how you get the color code. And then once we, uh, then we can do this to all isomorphic child theories. And then it turns out that we only care about, uh, in order to get all the automorphisms, we only care about one way of obtaining color codes, even though there exist many ways. So we fix this one way of obtaining color codes, and then we choose many, many ways to get Tory codes. And then we turn it into a condensation graph, and this is just a schematic, right? Uh, and then it turns out that uh, if I choose this color code as a reference point to which I always come back, and now I just like explore all the possible cycles on this condensation graph, then it turns out that that already gives me all 70 automorphisms. And um, yeah, and the uh, condensation that we perform are just the condensation that we would have to perform from the parent codes to get to each child code, but now we have to just use them to go between the child codes. And in code uh, language, it just means that there are a corresponding two body measurements that allow us to do that. Okay, and in a more general case, I think I think I sort of that's sort of the point I was I already explained when I was showing the the honeycomb codes, right? So we are looking at a billion theories. So we don't need to specify the entire algebra. We just need to specify this set of objects that we condense. That's enough. And uh, so assume that we have two condensations at step one and step two. What does it really mean for a general dynamic automorphism code for, for these condensations to be allowed in, in a code? It means that, okay, so if I specified, uh, so this would be my set of objects. So this will be the true vacuum. So um, this would be my first condensation, the first round. And uh, these, all these like little objects I drew here are just the anions of the parent theory. And uh, so this would be my uh, set of objects in A1. And every other anion in the parent theory is other con confined because it uh, breaks them trivially with the anions I'm trying to condense, or they form equivalence classes that look like this maybe, I don't know. So, and these become new anions of the child theory C1. And so, so this is what my child theory looks like. For example, everything that is not circled is con confined and everything that is in a circle is condensed. And then, um, so, and then assume that I have a condensation A2 for the next round and that condensation, for example, looks like this and that will be my A2. And as you see, like my vacuum is necessarily condensed in each round. So uh, now like I noted that my other objects that I've condensed in the next round, they are necessarily the ones that are confined. That turns out to be in a necessary condition. And then it turns out that for this, uh, and so for these two possible condensations to be reversible, it means that for every anion in the child theory two, child theory one, there has to be an anion in child theory two that, um, that has an overlap within the parent theory. So for example, uh, so this would be the anions of child theory two. And the picture will necessarily look like this. There will always be an object uh, within the parent theory that uh, is shared among the any representatives in both theories. And that's the object that is responsible for the theories being isomorphic. And it's also responsible for the logical information being transferred between different rounds. So each of these anions will turn into, if we uh, wind this anion around the homological and trivial loop, that anion will be the one that is responsible for the, for the logical information being transferred between rounds and rounds. So that's really what we mean by uh, condensation graph of reversible condensation, each condensation, each pair of subsequent condensation has to look like this specifically. So that's what the general DA code does. So in the honeycomb code example, you find only overlap on one. Yes, yes. And uh, so if you overlap on one, you get different things. 
that's a good question. I think, yeah, no, I, th I think it's also quite generic. Yeah, I think it's quite generic, especially if you would try to do something non abelian, then you would have to overlap and open it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you already like the amount of body confirmation you have is already in the uh, number of child. It's already sort of like contained in the in the kind of child theory you get, and because you sort of guarantee that the child theory is isomorphic, nothing really changes in terms of logical information, right? But it's just like a curious case when there is more than one shared representative or representatives like not one dimensional. That's cool. Um, yeah, and that's just a picture of like, yeah, so so we don't have really, really good understanding of what it means to perform sequential condensation without actually like thinking of going to the parent and back. That addresses Matt's question. Um, basically, we really have to think of going going up to the parent theory every time, finding this shared, shared set of logical representatives that I just uh, drew. Um, and then going back to the next child theory, and we end up performing a set of isomorphism between child theories, but then a product of those isomorphisms around uh, closed cycles, that's what gives us an automorphism of the same code, right? And like it just happens that we are able to obtain a trivial automorphism by going like this. So yeah, going back to this picture, so these are the cycles that we get. Uh, yeah, and like as I as I said, yeah. So, so that's a message I was trying to say before when I was explaining honeycomb code is that for every pair, I can actually find the consistent label for each anion. But once I perform like once I close the cycle, there does not exist a consistent label for the same anion. The anion has to change its label. Yeah. So for boundaries, I think I'm sort of probably should skip it because it's like an, an extra story. It's just a point that before. Before like our work, I believe like the entire business of boundaries was not very clear because it wasn't clear why you can't have a boundary with the same period as the bulk, right? So bulk changes this period, like bulk conversation at least occurs with period three, but it looks like you cannot have a boundary condition that would have period three. And the reason, uh, so may maybe the one message that I want to say is that um, the reason is because not all boundaries are left invariant by given automorphisms. And that's why you would actually need to change a boundary condition in accordance with the automorphism. There exists at Martin's this material index, which is the work by Asin and uh, Roger Monk, where like you can show that under like that EM automorphism of Tory code, for example, there is no boundary that would be left invariant. So there does not exist non-period doubling boundary. So yeah, so so may, maybe now once we understand like this, this picture, boundaries became sort of easier and like. You, you can also define what a fault tolerant boundary is. It's a boundary for which once you track the logical operator through time, it will form like a continuous membrane. And that, that's sort of what is really needed for fault tolerance, talking about speaking of it um, at a very high level. And that's what we actually, yeah, that's just an advertisement. I don't mean to explain this. I just wanted to say that really we needed um, to look at polletory codes. We cannot do this even on the title rectangular patches in order to actually be able to do the full clinical group we had to do a color code triangle rather than just regular patches and then we would have stacks of the triangles as I said before and then for dynamic automorphism codes again I'm, it's enough to maybe say just one uh, yeah like it's going to take like maybe five more minutes so for 3d color codes our citations are strings and uh, uh, loops and um yeah, it, it doesn't matter how exactly they behave. What is important is that there exists, um, it, it, like similarly for the 3D color code as and for uh, three copies of the 3D Tory code, there exists domain walls classified by uh, type three cycles, uh, by natural type three cycles with Z2, Z2, Z2 symmetry. And these, uh, uh, if uh, a magnetic flux goes through such a domain wall, it uh, has to be multiplied by an SPT like excitation, so called Hagen charge. And um, so, this domain wall, if we realize it in the temporal direction, that would correspond to a non Clifford gate in the language of QI. And that's an interesting gate because it's something that does not occur in 2D. Um, and uh, that's what we managed to do microscopically in our code. Basically, we can also do this kind of temporal domain wall, and we have a Fouquet code that has a non Clifford gate. But interestingly, the specific, uh, the specific 
yeah, it's a specific operator that generates this domain wall. Once you try to create like a local Hamiltonian model for, for, for your 3D color code or 3D rhetoric codes, uh, this specific unitary that generates this domain wall will not be a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. It will necessarily be only a symmetry of the code space. And therefore, uh, you cannot apply this to excited states. You, this will not be like a, a legal symmetry. It will actually transform excitations not trivially. So therefore, in order to actually do this fault tolerantly, you would need to clean up your system. You would need to go to the to, to go to the ground state, and then you would apply the uh, unitary transformation because the unitary is only a symmetry of the code space and not a symmetry of the Hamiltonian, which is weird because it does not appear at the QT level because there we only have a ground space, right? Uh, but in, on the lattice, somehow we end up in a much more tricky situation and we don't quite understand, is we know that what we condense here are rotating charges and we know that that cannot be done for poly operator and we necessarily need to measure Clifford operators that are not poly. But again, we don't have a very good understanding of why this happens uh, in language organizations. So we sort of know what's happening in our code. We sort of know the microscopics but it's it's sort of like a murky area, but it's it's sort of a cool result from perspective of track. Okay, so yeah, so I guess this is the conclusion. So since I didn't talk, yeah, so maybe I didn't talk as in a in as structured way about quantum computing side of things. I would like to conclude first in quantum computing side. So in quantum computing, we are able to combine error correcting code itself with quantum computation performed on logical information. And in two dimensions, we are able to do 72 automorphisms, and we are also able to do a full Clifford group by, uh, like, actually putting system on it with uh, on a patch with boundaries. Then we also are able to do an interesting automorphism and a Clifford gate in 3D, and we also address error correction. And we sort of like, yeah, it's it's sort of a different difficult topic in dynamic codes, and that's only maybe a start of that subject. And then just maybe a more general conclusion is that uh, if we assume this picture when we have a parent code and we have a set of child codes obtained by condensations, uh, we can come up with a condensation graph and we can find like classifiable possible cycles and we can uh, construct the trivial dynamics measurements and use dynamics from that. So that's sort of, yeah, our conclusion from our main conclusion from our work. And then maybe the open questions would be, uh, do we actually need a single parent for all conditions in order to do dynamic codes? The answer is probably no, but we just don't have a theory for that. Then uh, are there interesting generalizations? Are there like any other interesting things you can do? Uh, another question is like, are there like, again, can we classify and trivial measurement to do dynamics? And like the power and that one power of measurement to do dynamics is that you really are able to cool down things by measurements and you can guarantee that you can cool down things which is not possible in case of nature evolution. And then uh, from perspective of quantum information, we really want to uh, show robust inverse quantum computation and do the PC codes that probably is the future of quantum information. And that sort of concludes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, so any questions or comments from the audience? So before that, I should also advertise Margarita's for people job. <laughs> so I think at this moment, if you're watching on YouTube or maybe online, I think she still has opening. But I think one of the things you come back right away and watch this talk. And she's done a reading work with uh, Levitov and uh, Yang Fu, and right now, not just condensed matter, also coming information. So she should be very competent uh, candidate for your, your position. So. Any questions, comments, deal? Any job offers? You bring it. Yeah, yeah, right. That's right. So when you do this measurement, uh, measurement only stuff, so if I understand correctly, you're not doing the active correction, you're keeping track. Apart from non Clifford gates, yeah, there no you yeah. have to, yeah. So, what we're assuming is that you perform a classical computation that tells you what the active error correction has to be. Yeah. And that is actively 
fed into your protocol. So a protocol is made adaptive by sort of absorbing that classical information about what the error correction should be. That's measurement based. Exactly. So it's still measurement based. You don't do error correction by unitaries, but you absorb that information into your measurements. So measurements have to be adaptive now. Yeah, for Clifford's, it's always possible to postpone error correction. So you take one try. So in the yes. um, you're saying that it's uh, you it because the doesn't actually On excited states, it's, it's, just not, it's not a symmetry, yeah. So in order to, to be like, yeah, to show that it works, it, it really is only a symmetry of the code space of the ground state space. It's a symmetry of the ground state space. Did you did you rule out the possibility of a an automorphism in some two D D A realizing a non Clifford state? Yeah, in in linear time though. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It it looks like like honestly, like from from a gut feeling, it feels like the non Clifford theorem should still work. So you can get a non Clifford gate in constant time. Uh, at least using our method, it's guaranteed because in our method, we reversible conversations actually map onto finite depth local unitary effect. So it means that, like, you sort of like can straightforwardly generalize that it's impossible. But again, they are all reversible, but we don't know if we like so. So they're all the conversations that we perform, at least in our work, are locally reversible, but we don't know if that's necessary for things to, to, to work, right? Like, it could be not locally reversible. But if we stick to local reversible, you can't do long, you can't do Clifford in a constant time, but you can still do Clifford in a linear and system size time, um, and that's actually something I'm working on. So you're saying that 